Hello, I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. And this is Zenith, that podcast where we fall into a volcano because this week we watched Volcano. <laughs> this week we watched Volcano. Yeah, we watched Volcano. <laughs> Written by Alan Pryor. Directed by Desmond McCarthy. And aired on January 21st, 1980. Oh boy, here we go. This is going to be an interesting volcano. episode. Uh, once again, Doctor Who Watch, we're airing after Shada, after, not Shada, we're airing when Shada would have aired. Airing after, really? Airing when it would have aired or I after when so. it would have aired? No, because Shadow was six episodes, so this would be right at the tail end of when Shadow was airing, would have been you mean airing. Shada yeah, or whatever. Right. It was. <laughs> That's what I meant. <laughs> and after, was it Power of Crawl? I don't remember. Horns of Nymon, Horns I think, of was right before Why do Shada? I keep mixing up Powers of Crawl and Horns of Nymon? <laughs> Horns of Nymon. Even have it on my notes, it's Horns of Nymon. <laughs> and, well, anyway. I mean, once again, like, I just forget that we talk about Doctor Who and when, what, what Doctor Who was airing during this every single week. That's okay. I still forget the name of Bounty every single week. So, uh, But anyway, Volcano. I right. think maybe we should just say before getting into anything else, like, I thought this was a pretty weak episode in terms of how Blake 7 episodes usually are. I mean, Me too, but before we even get into that, if you'll remember last week we said we're going to start doing these quiz questions, right. so let's get those out of the way. Remember, we're going to give the questions now, and then we're going to put the answers at the end of our discussion, but before we talk about emails, so you can right. play along at home, I guess. <laughs> get out your clickers now. Get and, out your uh, answer pads. And since you usually go first with these, I guess I'll go first this time. <laughs> okay, yeah, you go ahead and go first this time, so... You know, it's the first time we're doing this. <laughs> So, mine is a multiple choice one. Milas and Natson, I think his name was, both wore different colored belts in the story. What color were they? A, red and blue, B, red and green, C, blue and green, or D, red and yellow? Okay, and then, you know, write your answers down or just store them in your head. <laughs> My question is also multiple choice. Uh, when Zen retrieves prior information on the planet Obsidian... Uh, about midway through the episode, he references that the information comes from a prior date. What is the date code that he uses? Is it A... Alan prior date. Okay, sorry. <laughs> the Alan prior date. <laughs> is it A, 103? Is it B, 202? Is it C, 303? Or is it D, 333? So get your, uh, get your answers in now. Buzz them in. <laughs> Text them to us. Oh, God. <laughs> Should we provide a phone number? No. No, no. We can make a Google Voice number, actually, if people want to call. Instead of emailing and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. That might actually be something to... That, actually. that might actually be something to consider. Uh, we'll talk about that off recording and come right. to a and consensus. Again, we just decide and bring these things up on recording. <laughs> anyway, I th yeah, I thought this was a pretty weak episode. Apparently, I found out this actually has a pretty weak opinion in the fandom at least i learned that from sergeant drano even though i think it's a favorite of a couple people right and again i don't think this is a bad episode there are definitely things i like about it it's just weaker than like almost every other blake seven episode the only two mm -hmm. i would put under it are really orac and redemption yeah i put it down there this is just this is i think the first episode of blake seven that i just really could not get into I could, yeah, I could I just not focus on it at all. And honestly, yeah, I felt the same way, which was interesting to me because there was a lot of like conceptual stuff that could be pretty interesting, right? Like the pacifist group, mm -hmm. they have their own this volcano planet, they have this self-destruct mechanism, but really I couldn't get into any of it. And I think at the end of the day for me, the reason why I came down to that is that I actually think sending Dell and Dana down to the planet was like a critical mistake on Alan Pryor and Chris Boucher's part. I think... I think the reason why it's a mistake is because these are both new characters to the show. And I think putting both of the two new characters down on the planet together really didn't give me anything to get invested in. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think, you know, you could have had either Dell or Dana and then yeah, it could probably have been Avon. Dana and Avon or, or Maybe Callie, even Callie. And, Callie and Dell. Callie and Dana would have been interesting. Villa and Dell would have been really interesting. Yeah. I think just having one of the Liberator crew on the planet with one of the two new characters would have instantly just made this a lot better, in my opinion, because it would have actually given me something to be rooting for. And, you know, then we'd have someone on the Liberator interacting with the Liberator crew, and it would basically give us a real insight to both of their characters at once. Seeing them interplay off each other is like, we don't have any reference point for these two characters, really. Right. You know, 
when it's just them two together, we don't have any of the familiar Liberator characters there to play off of. However, to play devil's advocate, because I think I think we should bring this up, if you started with season three, there's no way you would know... You would know that Dell and Dana aren't part of the main crew. Right, but you wouldn't know really anything about Avon, Callie, and Villa. That's true. So maybe... You know, if you started with with Series C, this isn't necessarily a complaint you would have. Yeah, and that just boils down to, like, your own perspective, I guess. Yeah. And, well, we get do get the info at the beginning of this, or at least it seems like it's been quite a while since mm-hmm. Del and Dana joined. Yeah, but there is, I think there's, like, a throwaway line where they said part of the reason why they're on Obsidian is because they're looking for Blake. Right, there's been rumors that Blake is on Obsidian. They're not true, as we learn later. The episode starts with Dell and Dana beaming down. I'm not going to lie, I totally thought Dell was Blake for a second. He looked exactly like Blake right there. I mean, he does from far away. Like, he definitely looks like him. And this episode is, I can start to see, like, why people say that Dell is, like, almost a replacement for Blake. This mm-hmm. is actually what uh, my what would Blake do for this episode. Mm-hmm. I definitely think Blake would have gone down to this planet himself. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, and even if he didn't, like, there's no way he would have let these two new crew members go down, I think. I mean, that was the thing about Blake is that even though he was the leader of the group, he always got his hands dirty with everything they did. He was always one of the people down on the planet. Right. Almost every time. Not every time, but. that's all. You can also chalk that up to, like, this is a small crew, right? But, like, mm-hmm. yeah, I get what you're saying, too. I don't know how much of the rest of the story would have played out any differently if it was Blake down there actually really Instead of Honestly, Del, instead you mean? of Del, yeah, that's a good point. A lot of it would have been really similar. And my "What would Blake?" moment do later is is pretty much the same. I don't think a lot of the story would have changed. Th- that's also the thing with like Del and Dana. They don't really. They could have done. I agree that like it should have been like what we said before, either mm-hmm. Del and Avon or Dana and Avon, something like that. But they don't even. They could have done more with these two characters in terms of like. Right. That's the other thing yeah. is that. They we already still, feel a little flat. Yeah, we still know very little about Dell if you really think about it. Right, and even uh, Dana as well. And I think actually Dell was done better than Dana, which doesn't, it's not a good sign to me. Not a good sign. No, but. and I've already read Drano's email for this episode. Yeah, so actually, you know, speaking about Dana last week, we also had an email who brought up, I think, something that, that was interesting that I think we should talk about more in the coming episodes this season. She mentioned that Josette Simon, who plays Dana, actually refuses to play Dana in the audio dramas because she feels that the, quote, noble warrior, quote, role was sexist and racist. Or, or, yeah, sure. So I think that's something that we should uh, keep in mind and we should bring up because I definitely think in this episode, you know, what is what is Dana's purpose in this episode? Right, I mean, Dell didn't have much, but even then there was like, there was some stuff, right? Like, he's, oh, I don't trust anyone. That's why I've survived mm-hmm. this long. There was stuff like that. Dana is like... There was just yeah, nothing. Dana's point in this episode is to show up shoot and, cu- and shoot a couple people. Like, She tries to restrain Dell, right? She has a mini conversation with the leader guy, whose name I am mm-hmm. forgetting. But like, even then, like, this isn't a good sign for Dana. Yeah, I think She's she being could, shoved into yeah. that role that really Jenna was shoved into, mm-hmm. but a lot earlier. Yeah. But like I said, I think that really comes down to just this story putting Dell and Dana together, two characters who we don't know anything about. Yeah. You know, and that was the thing, you know, if we draw parallels back to the start of the show, when the show started, we didn't meet all seven at the same time. We met Blake in the first episode and then in uh, the we way back. We met Blake, uh, Villa, and Jenna in the first episode. We met episode. those three in the first episode and then we meet Avon. But, you know, Avon is always shown in reference to, to either Blake or Villa or Jenna when we meet him, right? We never see Avon alone. We we don't meet Avon with Gan, right? Right. And it isn't really until Cygnus Alpha where Gan really does... We really don't meet Gan until Cygnus Alpha, basically. Yeah, and then, yeah, we meet, Gan shows up in Spacefall, but, like, we don't really ever, we, like we I'm saying. We don't get into, like, who Gan is. Yeah, it's not like, it's not like Avon and Gan are the two main characters of that episode, no, right? No, and, and even then, like, Gan's particular point, other than, like, he's the strong man or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, the fact that he has a, uh, God, what is, I'm forgetting what it's called, a uh, limiter mm-hmm. isn't brought up until, which one was, it was, no, it wasn't the web, it was episode four, whose name I'm forgetting. <sighs> It was the one after Cygnus Alpha. Right, it's the one, or um, Time Squad, that was it. Time Squad. And that's the thing, you know, when we actually meet, quote, meet Gan, unquote, 
in Cygnus Alpha, he doesn't go down to the planet with like Avon. He goes down with, I think he goes down with. Uh, he, well, he's on the planet. He Blake rescues him. Yeah, Blake Villa. rescues him from the planet because he gets. And then Callie is uh, isn't introduced until Time Squad either. Yeah, so and it's Callie, this, you we know, meet Callie four, in Time Squad. It's this four episode arc, really, of mm-hmm. them gathering the crew members. Whereas here, it seems like. It almost it's like a feels, two episode type of deal. Yeah, it almost feels like here they're trying to like rush through introducing Dana and Dell, which is why they sent them both down to the planet. It's like this is how we get the most time out of them, right? Because that really is the a plot of the story: is Dana and Dell are on this planet, and the reason why they're on this planet we haven't mentioned yet is because they're trying to get new recruits and they're trying to find. Basically, they want to start like a, an actual like base on a planet somewhere instead of being on the Liberator and moving around constantly. And they think that Obsidian would be a good place to start this. The Federation base. hasn't touched it because of the volcanic activity, supposedly. Yeah. And, I mean, you bring up the A plot and B plot type thing that Blake 7 usually does, but even in this, there's not really much of a B plot. It's almost the same thing, really. They all tie into each other pretty seamlessly. They do tie into each other, but until that tie in moment, it's definitely an A B plot with the Liberated crews just in orbit being attacked by by Federation crew, and they're yeah, like, what's going I guess, on? I guess, yeah. The, and then it, basically, Dell and Dana stop communicating with the liberator and they're like oh what happened they probably got captured and then avon reveals that he knew that there was like a tripwire down on the planet this is my what would blake moment uh, what, what would blake, blake do? do moment because i don't think because avon reveals that he basically knew about this but he kept it hidden from them and didn't tell them about it and kelly's like wow <laughs> in my opinion i think blake would have told them about it mainly because i don't think blake would have wanted them to get captured uh, you know, this is assuming Blake doesn't go down to the planet himself. Right. This is like if Blake hadn't told them about like the Forbidden Zone or whatever, yeah. that's a minefield or something like that. Yeah. Almost. Like, I definitely think Blake would have told them about it, if only because he wouldn't want them to get captured because, you know, say what you will about Blake, he knows how to recruit people to his <sighs> cause at least. So he knows that if they're getting, you know, if they trip that wire, if they're getting captured, that's not going to look good on them. And could right. get them killed because they really don't know anything about these people. Like, if these people are actually hostile, they need to have the, the drop on them kind of thing. Well, like we mentioned, they set off the alarm alerting the people. They show up and they, like, missed them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's it's some sort of, like, knockout gas or something. <laughs> yeah. They bring them to their base, which actually looked pretty cool. I like the sort of yeah. swirl design. It looked very ancient. It, looks al- it looked almost like they don't touch on this, so this is just speculation. But it looked almost like they this was you know, catacombs or like something from an ancient civilization and then they just started using it for their own purposes almost. It reminded me of like an Egyptian tomb almost. Not Egyptian, kind of Egyptian-esque. Um, it looked like there were hieroglyphics written on the columns. Except they're all just swirls. Yeah. Well, it was made out of stone. I think that's why yeah. it gives off that sort of ancient vibe. Mm-hmm. And they've taken, apparently Dell and Dana brought their six extra teleport bracelets down. Right. And Dell tries to play it off as they break a lot. <laughs> and Dana's like, yeah. And they're having none of that. We're introduced to a couple of the main characters. I think there's only two real important ones, the leader and his son. Mm-hmm. The leader has a pretty annoying lisp, actually. Commander Mori? Is that the son or the dad? I, I couldn't tell Oh, Howard is the dad because he, the reason, another reason why they're Obsidian is because magically this guy, Howard, is an old friend of Hal Mellonby, which instantly is a retcon because if you remember back to um, Aftermath, uh, all of Hal's friends were killed by the Federation because he mm. was a traitor. Maybe Howard never joined Hal's cause. Maybe he was just a friend from... I think... I, don't they actually say in this that he was a friend from like military school or something? I guess. Oh, Hal was played by Michael Goff. No wonder I recognized him. It's a celestial toy maker. Oh, wow. <laughs> From the Celestial yeah. Toy Maker. wow. Huh. Huh. I was like, man, he seems familiar for some reason, but I couldn't place it. Huh, that's actually surprising to me. Yeah, it's, I didn't notice it at all. Yeah, so Howard and then his son, I think, is... is Who's his son? Maury. Maury, I think. Or wait, was Maury the Federation guy? I think he was. Mm, yeah, Maury was the Federation guy. Jeez, this is really confusing. Bosha? 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 I think was the son. Yeah, Bosha was his son. It's Howie, Howie, not Howie, Howie, and Bosha, 
And Moy is the Federation captain. Find, we find out Sovlan also has a passing interest in Obsidian, especially since the Liberator's there. Right. Servalan is now reinstalled as president of what remains of the Federation, at least. Well, her military coup was successful, I guess, is the message we're getting here. Yeah. The She's, she's a president of a broken empire. Yeah, which she didn't want to be, but... she's The reason why she's crumbled. looking at Obsidian is because, once again, Star One has been destroyed, so they're looking for a new base uh, for Federation operations. Right, and she mentions, I think, that they passed up on Obsidian for some other reason... Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think we find out later that it was these people's threats. Yeah. Uh, But I don't don't remember why she says, like, it's a good idea to go back. But it's fine. Like, it doesn't matter yet, probably. Well, also, they get summoned by Bashar because he sends a message like, hey, the Liberator crew's here. So so Silvan's, we gotta go kill the Liberator crew. Howard explains their pacifist nature. He says Mm -hmm. they've, like, genetically modified aggression out of their... Well, he says Psyches. genetically modified, but then he implies that they use electroshock therapy. Yeah. Which and then I he think, implies I think it's that they like, lobotomize people. No, I, I was like, Jesus. I think it's a combination of both. I think they somehow genetically modified them, however that works. And then like, but that's not a perfect process, right? The mm-hmm. people who still show some aggressive tendencies are given this shock therapy. A it minor will... shock, so he says. <laughs> Whether or not we believe him, I don't, I don't know. Him. It reminds me of how... Oh, this was really dark. What? You know, uh, JFK wasn't the only Kennedy child. He yeah. he had two brothers, but he also had a sister who had some mental illness problems. So their dad had her lobotomized. Oh, well, yeah, that's like lobotomies not... used to be a legitimate, yeah, quote legitimate unquote. Uh, g- quote cure unquote for <laughs> mental illness yeah we'll just read uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest you know just really sad is this just and this just made me think of it there you know these people think that or believe that aggression is like something that needs to be stamped out which is a is a common actual like theme throughout a lot of works throughout history like oh, aggression is bad and aggression needs to be removed you know in the purge which we just watched huh. like a week ago it's like oh you for let triple your, play our movie yeah. trilogy podcast check that out you let your aggression out for one night and then you're not aggressive for the rest of the year like it's all a lot of th- things talk about how to remove aggression and this story is like oh we're gonna like almost like genetically lobotomize them really sure and it, that, it just reminded me of that when they were like oh yeah we'd like removed that part of their brain like genetically, and then we like electroshock them. It just reminded me of like how they used to lobotomize people. Yeah. So. And then what happens is Dana oh, and Dell get turned over to the Federation. That's but not really because there's a Dana's lot of like, stuff that happens later. We can talk about Dana's like outfit for a minute. She's wearing like bright pink pants. <laughs> It doesn't. I mean, it looks like a strangely out of place because the rest of the costumes, basically in the entire show, have looked mm-hmm. like either medieval tunics of some sort or like. I mean, space Series B started outfits. out with that way, way sci-fi look for everybody. Yeah, but if the, you remember like, Blake's massive sleeves and and Jenna's like Starfield pattern shirt, and, and even Avon in this looks pretty sci-fi. He's wearing that black thing again. Avon, but once Dana- again, uh, or Villa is once again the voice of reason in this one. Yeah, that's true again. But Dana just looks like a modern day person. That doesn't look like something that, it looks like something you might wear today. Yeah. Possibly. Possibly. It's just kind of the uh, give everybody their own look thing, except Del, who looks I like think Blake. Drano in his email this week says that Del raided Drake's closet. <laughs> Drake's. <laughs> Blake. What if Drake was on Blake's set? What Blake's he- long lost. <laughs> what if Blake comes back and is like, oh no, I'm not Blake. I'm a Drake. Blake's a long lost <laughs> twin. Anyway. But anyway, there's stuff going on on the Liberator. Villa is, like you mentioned, being the voice of reason, which is back to the norm for him. You know, it was only mm-hmm. really that one episode where he yeah, was sort of a, week. yeah, he was sort of a gullible Power fool. Play. Power play, right. I mean, the Liberator stuff is like, it feels really weird to me. Like, it feels like we're kind of forced, actually, in some scenes. Like, the scene where Callie tells Orak to man the teleport and 
Orac doesn't respond. She's like, just do it. And Orac's like, that's a toss. That's like, it's a menial toss more suited to someone like you. And she's like, just do it, Orac. Like, it just comes out like really forced. Sure, I don't know I why think that is. That particular line could have worked better with Avon since there was that antagonism set up between Avon and Orac. Yeah, possibly. I think Avon's just trying to work his way into the leader role still. And he's still trying to find his leadership boots, so to speak. Yeah, and that's actually hard when you're looking, still looking for Blake. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's, you know, he's ostensibly still looking for Blake, which is like, to do that, you have to admit that to some capacity, Blake is important to this crew and you need Blake, right? Right. I don't think the other crew members have really acknowledged Avon as, you know, their leader yet. Because they're, yeah. st- they're still looking for Blake. And that's the thing. Looking for Blake, too, you almost have to acknowledge that Blake is still the leader, kind of. Yeah. Which, in doing so, that makes it I very mean, difficult for Avon to step into any sort of leadership role. Yeah, I mean, look, they're looking for Blake, right? Not Jenna. So. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even, though, the thing. even though Jenna did send that message, like, don't look for me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't come looking for me. I'm done with you criminals. <laughs> you crims. Even though she was probably the, one of the most criminal of all of them, honestly. That's true. <laughs> Anyway, then what happens is the Federation people take the bracelets and they're like teleport, which apparently becomes through really sketchily in the teleport room because Callie just believes that it's Dell and Dana. Maybe she hasn't right. blown the voices yet. Well, she beams them up. We get we also get some stuff with Servalan. But you know, Villa beams them up because he's like, they're in trouble. Beam them up. Yeah, Callie's skeptical and Villa is the one who is like, just do it. And he flips the switches. But we get some stuff with Servalan. Um, there's this Federation commander, I guess, named Mori. Mm-hmm. And... He, Servalan is, you know, using him to do her dirty work. He's the proto-Travis for the story, basically. Basically. She tells him that if he wins, he can have the Liberator in his own command. He can become basically Supreme Commander, which is what Servalan was before. Yeah, which, who knows if that's even a promise she's willing to keep. I th- yeah, the way she says it, I thought she was just going to backstab and kill Mori as soon as this was over, really. Right, and there, there's this, again, running trend in this season of, like, rumors and reported speech and, like, how people leverage that to their advantage. Because Servaland knows that, you know, it's just rumors, I guess, that Blake was on Obsidian. Mm-hmm. But she points to, like, the, the value and how that put her, like, her in a position of power that Avon right. and the rest of the crew believed those rumors. Mm-hmm. Which is something they're continuing on, basically, from Aftermath. Yeah. It's interesting. I want to see where that goes in this season. I, I mean, mean later I mean later on there's that line from Howard, the truth is absolute. <laughs> the truth is absolute. That's what he says. <laughs> so we'll get more into that later when he actually says it, which is near the end of the episode. Yeah. They beam up. And now Callie tries to telepathically tell Avon that there's people on the ship. And I guess Avon just just ignores her because he seems to just show no acknowledgement <laughs> of Callie's telepathic message. He just doesn't even seem to, to believe that she's sending him anything. Right. This might have something to do with how Avon is kind of skeptical of Callie's abilities in the first place. Possibly. But then why even include Callie trying to use a telepathy there? Just because I'm just she's trying to do it, we hear it as the audience, but yeah, again, it seems like Avon doesn't really pick up on it. Avon's I also trying to does, fight off a couple of ships which are attacking them. I, th- I think he does pick up on when she messages, sends a message to him that there are three people. Mm-hmm. I think he does because that's what like gives him the not incentive, but that after, after he hears that, he's like, All right, I can handle this. If I take them by yeah. surprise, there's only three guys I can do this. Mm-hmm. Except he doesn't. <laughs> yeah. So he almost does. He he gets shot in the arm, but yeah. Yeah, almost. He shoots two of them, and in our new segment, does Avon hold his gun like a six shooter this week? Uh, the surprising answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> what a shock! <laughs> he holds it like you. Everybody else holds the liberated gun. There's surprisingly. that. There's that dramatic draw of his gun before he beams down to the planet, mm-hmm. which was kind of western esque, I guess. Western-esque. Yeah. But I was shocked to learn that one week after we introduced the segment, the answer is already no. What if he doesn't do it again? Oh, God. <laughs> I feel like when he drew the gun, he would have done, like, a, an exaggerated flip if it was if the Liberator gun, like, allowed you to do that. If it yeah, wasn't but just except like, it's got that cable that runs across to the power pack. Which, and it doesn't have, like, it's not like a traditional gun shape either. It's more right. just uh, air hockey puck. <laughs> yeah, glued to a stick. <laughs> Yeah, but Avon gets shot in the arm, and he's like, damn, that's my good arm. (laughs) 
he just he sort seems of walks to heal up off, pretty quick. Yeah, even the guy, even the Federation guy who gets shot by Avon, one of them just sort of gets up and takes Orak out of the room because Orak gets kidnapped, basically. Well, they don't kidnap him yet. The reason why they kidnap him is because the Mori messages Serverland's like, hey, I'm in control of the Liberator. And then two minutes later, Avon causes Zen to fire on the ships. And then Serverland's like, what the hell, Mori? And he starts <laughs> firing back. And then Mori's like, we better get out of here before we get destroyed. <laughs> So still they using, kidnap Orak. Still using the Ensor beam. Still using the green, you know, sort of thin laser. They kidnap Callie, too. Yeah. And then Villa, Villa beams him down. He's like, don't worry, Callie. You'll be safer on the surface than up here. And then him and Avon are just chilling in the, like, the bridge. And <laughs> Villa's made this concoction of soma and adrenaline in the same, like, drink. And I'm like, wouldn't that no, kill you? Adrenaline and soma was always what it was. They just shortened it to soma most of the time. Isn't actually, Soma and Adrenaline like the opposite thing though? Like doesn't Soma yeah. calm you down and yeah, Adrenaline like so. boost you up? Wouldn't that kill you? That's like injecting horse tranquilizer into one arm and speed into the other okay. arm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't know. And he offers it to Avon and Avon's like, I would we, rather not think. It's just a disgusting green concoction. Yeah, we finally see it. It looks like, I don't just bright green. It looks like the sun. <laughs> maybe, no, maybe this is what Servaline was drinking in that one time she was drinking that green liquid. Maybe, but I was going to say it looks like, <laughs> it looks like the slime. Slimer gives off in Ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> They're just sitting there and I, maybe this was just me, but I, I felt like Villa was suggesting they just leave, honestly. I think that is kind of what he was suggesting. They eventually get into contact with Dana and Dell, and and Dell is like, "Look, I think we." Or Dana's like, "Yeah, I think we can still do something here." And also, like, Avon mentions that they've got Orak, so Dell and Dana are like, "Oh, we'll go retrieve Orak then." And Avon's like, "If you're not back in like an hour, I'm going to consider the Liberator a bigger priority." And which is basically <laughs> Avon speak for, "If you're not back in an hour, I'm leaving you." Yeah. Yep. They get back just on time, just after time, actually. Right. Well, so what happens is they go off looking for the Federation dudes led by Mori because they're just hiding yeah. out in the cave yeah. or a little like alcove type thing. Mm -hmm. They find them, and that's it's it, like a fire they just fight. Find them, yeah. Callie tries to communicate telepathically with them, and. Dana's like, do you hear that voice? And Dell's like, what voice? Maybe, maybe this is, I'm, maybe I'm giving the show too much credit, but maybe this is the start of something like tell, Callie's powers are weakening or something. Maybe they'll touch on this a little bit later. Maybe. If they do, I will retract my statement that this is a really dumb choice. If they do, I will be really surprised. I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, I think it's just a, a story element they chose to put into this. It makes sense. It makes a lot more sense for Dell and Dana because they're not, they haven't like been they with Callie for as long. They don't know about Callie's abilities necessarily, either. right? So if they hear this voice in their head, they might just write it off as mm -hmm. just a voice in their head, a voice right. from the past, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> for Avon, though, it is slightly more strange. I think this is about the moment. Also, Avon talks with Zen and Zen, or, or yeah, Zen and Zen pulls up this information that they're like they've been neutral. They were they weren't even attacked for the entire war. That went on. Because they have this like fail safe mechanism. It's just this big red button next to their volcano display that allows them to self destruct. We didn't mention that. Yeah, because um, Howard reveals about now ish, actually. He reveals it now pretty early that they have like a nuke basically stored yeah. underneath the volcano. And if they activate it, it'll just blow up the entire planet, which is how they stayed neutral during the war. Because the thing is, Avon looks up if. Obsidian has any official declaration of neutrality because apparently you need that to be considered neutral. And Zen says no, and that's why Avon and Callie, actually, this is earlier, and Villa are suspicious that maybe there's something else going on on the planet. Right. Uh, and basically, Howard explains that anytime someone would land on the planet, they'd tell them they'd blow the planet up and take themselves with the, the enemy fleet. Yeah, someone, I think it's Dana, is like, well, you were just bluffing, right? And they're like, no, we weren't. <laughs> Except he doesn't actually say anything. He just kind of looks at Dana with that... That knowing look yeah, that basically look. says, no, we weren't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, good shit. <laughs> uh, basically, also Dana and Dell, I think before they go off, is this before or after they go to find a way? It's oh, before. We, we didn't mention actually that it was Ber Bershar mm -hmm. who like sort of sold them out. He contacted the Federation and that's because... And that's what I, I was about to mention is that Howard find, finds out that it was Bashar. Yeah, I didn't fully pick up on what was going on here. 
and I probably should have like gone back and rewatched the scene to to understand it more. But like Bashar, his pacifist, mm-hmm. his like pacifism, the process they used to pacify themselves didn't like fully work on him. He had these really aggressive tendencies. Mm-hmm. But, like, how but it, Howard was like, he was okay with it. He wanted like he wanted someone who was more aggressive than the rest of them for some reason. He said uh, he wanted someone who could think like his enemies. Yeah. And he just used his son because his son, I guess, it, coincidentally, his son was the person who, who filled this role or whatever. Yeah, Which that is, like, worked interesting. out really well. I mean, it's interesting. Like, they have this, like, total pacifist policy so to speak but they actually don't really right mm-hmm. they're just it's sort of just a front they they just, kept this yeah. guy in their back pocket essentially in they case have things a nuke go wrong underneath the planet yeah so they're gonna it's not really a nuke they call it something else but they see they're gonna blow up it's a self-destruct mechanism that it uses the power of the volcano or something yeah and then they they also introduced this oh, thing man. about the air like not being safe. I don't know what you're about to mention, but I just remember that they mentioned this thing about the air not being safe when when Bashar takes them outside first to hand them over to the Federation and Dell's like, you don't spend a lot of time up here. And he's like, yeah, the air is not so great. And then they kind of bring it back later with a volcano because Dell's like, yeah, that bomb underneath is the volcano like spreading the radioactive particles all over. <laughs> is that why the air sucks? And, and how it just doesn't answer. <laughs> so it's, it's probably why at least they bring it back on like not Horizon. God, what was the one with Inga and Ashton? Oh, man. I don't remember now. I the usually remember the, Blake's the seven titles. The one with the air that's, like, really thin? Yeah. Was that vo- That wasn't Voice from the Past. Uh, hostage. Right, Hostage. But, oh, man, we... They also, like, in this sort of scuffle with the Federation, this one guy falls off a cliff into the volcano, and, like, I was so shocked... I. And kind of, I don't, I don't want to say I disliked it because I didn't think it was like kind of funny, mm-hmm. but like he just, it's so so dramatic. It's like his death is given even more focus than like Travis's death. <laughs> like he just, he, it's, it looks really funny too. He falls in the volcano. Yeah. It's just, it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, why are you giving this Federation guy like this death? I, I mean, you want, it kind of reminds me almost of in Redemption when that guy falls off the railing. <laughs> Oh jeez, there are a lot of hilarious deaths in Blake Seven when you really think about it. Yeah, there are. During all of this, Avon has actually been trying to fix the Liberator because they did so much damage through the Force Wall that they don't even have navigation, so they can't go anywhere. So the auto repair systems are working, but they don't have enough power either. So Avon's like, "We gotta, we gotta move real quick." Cause... And then Avon's like, "Turn on all emergency power and move it to navigation." And then Zen doesn't respond, and and then Avon's like, "Zen." emergency power to navigation and and then zen's just like emergency power systems were destroyed in the battle they're gonna need to be repaired as well and avon's like what so the federation's closing in on them while zen tries to repair the systems they go a little over time actually if the federation just shot them they would be you know dead yeah well so this is sort of humorous scene the federation lands on the planet serverland is actually at the planet in a ship on the other side of the planet so shielded from the liberator by the planet so the Liberator doesn't actually know she's there. Right. When did they bring this up before with like two opposing ships on opposite sides of the planet? I seem to remember something along these lines. You know, I'm remembering it too, but I'm not remembering that story. The Liberator does it once. They move around a planet so that they can't be seen. Yeah, right. Was it Weapon? I don't remember I don't when remember. it was, honestly. And so, yeah, this is kind of humorous moment when they beam up Del, Dana, and Orac, and Del's like, why aren't we moving? And Avon's just like, or Villa's like, because we can't. <laughs> and then eventually they get it fixed and they leave. And Villa says some humorous line to end the episode that I don't even remember because that's how little attention I was paying. It was, it was, it was, um, if that, something like, if that's work, then I would rather not Oh, that's right. If that's, if like that's that. winning, I would rather oh, lose every right. time. Right. Yeah, if this right, is winning, Callie, I would rather lose every time. Because Callie says that both they themselves and Servalan and the Federation lost, and only the obs- people on Obsidian, Obsidian Knights, mm-hmm. Obsidianers. No, they were named like the Obsidians. No, no, no. <laughs> they were named the um, the Py- Pyroans or something. No, Pyro, Pyroans, yeah, Pyroans. And they, only, only, Callie <laughs> says that only they made it out winning. Yeah, oh yeah, that's also how the Federation ships get destroyed. They tell the Liberator to move out of the way, and then when the planet blows up, it like destroys a bunch of the Federation ships or damages them so they can't chase the Liberator down. Right. So is Mori dead? Does that mean Mori is 
I don't know because that would imply that maybe Servalang is dead too, but we know Servalang's not going to die like yeah. that. I wonder if I don't know honestly, and I wonder if Mori is a recurring character. Well, I guess we'll find out. Uh, I'm curious to know if he's going to be the his proto name, Travis for a while. His uh, name means death, right? Like Mori. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Just overall, I was like really underwhelmed by the story. I had a really difficult time like really getting into it. Yeah, again, the one thing like that I was actually interested in was like this trend that continued on from Aftermath and even Power Play mm-hmm. about like the nature of like truth and, and belief and stuff like that. And Howard has this line at one point, and I forget what prompts him to say this, but he goes, the truth is absolute. And again, I didn't look too much into this, but like good on this show even for even raising like epistemological and like ontological questions like this right and i mean there's definitely theory out there that you can read and not even theory even like fiction as well that deals with like the nature of truth and stuff like that and we bring up we brought up race in aftermath Mm -hmm. because well dana is basically the only main character on this the only non-white real main character on the show so far and how as well yeah but like if you read i remember because i Last year, at least, I read a few slave narratives. Most famous, the most famous slave narrative of all time, really, is uh, Frederick Douglass's. But I, I read a couple more, and like those, like they really deal with like the nature of truth. How like mm-hmm. a different perspective will give you like a different version of the truth, and and even more complicated stuff than that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it def- depends how granular you want to get with the truth. Truth, because I feel like there is a point at which truth is absolute, right? Like, I open the door. That it, like if I open a door, the truth is I open the door now. Mm, but like even then, that's so caught up in like the language of it that like I don't know. I have some specific beliefs on this that we don't really need to get into. But mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. I feel I just feel like if you get down to the most granular thing you can, there there is an absolute truth. It's something. But like we mentioned this before too. Again, in aftermath, but like there's all when you use language, you use rhetoric. Can you really? And I'm not like. I'm not using this as a rhetorical question. I'm really wondering and stuff. Can you really like get at truth? Can you really get at facts using rhetoric? Who knows? It's I something. So. It's something I think this story and this season so far is actually really exploring. Mm-hmm. And I again, I have some very specific opinions on that that we don't need to get into. Maybe we'll possibly get into them later mm-hmm. on in the show. Later in the season, maybe. Unless they just completely drop this next week. Yeah, like they, they could totally every could. Week. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, like I said at the beginning, I really feel like the story would have been a lot stronger if we had one of the main Liberator crew with either Del or Dana down on the surface and then had one yep. of them up on the ship. Uh, just because it would have given us interplay with the Liberator crew. And I think, you know, the best way to establish a, a new character to, to any ensemble cast is to, is to show their interactions with the ensemble as sure. it already exists. Yep. I mean, this is that's how Ocean's... Uh, 12 and 13 did it right you know when they when they had to bring new people in we we always saw their their interactions with the people who were already 12 also did through those questionable flashbacks right but you know every time we met like a new character who you know they we always were introduced to them through the the interactions of the ensemble and not like their own I guess like interactions with like another new character like in this episode now that you bring up Ocean's 11 this is all this is like the classic Ocean's Eleven, right? Where, like, right. these characters are interacting, yet there's, one, not much to them, mm-hmm. and they already know each other. And again, like we mentioned at the beginning of this episode, there there has been some adventure. There, there's been some amount of time between power play and this, right? Yeah. So, obviously, Dana and Del already know each other fairly well, uh, mm-hmm. enough to, like, go down to the planet or whatever. And again, Dell has that one line, like, I don't trust anyone. And Dana, like, that's even that is so minor, but Dana doesn't even have anything like that. Right. I mean, even this could have worked better if we had some line, because I thought initially that they were down there because this was going to be some sort of test, right? That Avon was testing them to see if they were loyal. And even if we had gotten... I didn't think that that was going to be the case. I think if we had maybe even gotten some line about that, like Avon's like, let's see how they do, or let's see if they are actually loyal or something like that. I think that's something Blake would actually do more so than Avon. Possibly, but what I'm saying is like, even if we had something like that, I think maybe that would have made this story work just a little bit better. I still think that they should have had one of the Liberator crew with one of the two on the surface. Yeah, yep. And that's like really my like only real thoughts on this episode because I had such a difficult time actually paying attention to it. Yeah, I didn't find this to be too interesting, honestly, so... Yeah, kind of disappointing, but actually. We did get, 
emails this week. Right, but before we get into that, we should give our answers to oh, the right. quiz questions. So, uh, you know, you should go first since your question was first. All right, I guess I'll just, we should remind people of the questions, right? Mm-hmm. So mine was Milas and Natson both were different. I think it was Nat 10 or something like that, actually. Yeah. They were the two guys we didn't even mention when we were talking about it, but they they weren't human. They were, they like teleported and Servland met with them and had them killed. I think they were pacifists. They were like teleporting though. It was weird. Yeah, I think it was implied that they had some sort of like teleporter technology there huh. too. Yeah, okay. Oh right, yeah, they were pacifists because they were Maury kill white. yeah, Maury kills them and they're like they weren't they weren't even scared. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I guess actually is related to the like anti total pacifism like nature of what this episode is. But anyway, my question was Milas and Nat Sin or Natin or whatever his name mm-hmm. was, both wore different colored belts. What color were they? And the answer was A, red and blue. Yeah, so if you guessed A, then you win the prize of being right. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> Let's see if you got my question right. My question was, I don't remember the exact wording I gave, but when Avon is talking with Zen and Zen pulls up uh, some prior information about Obsidian, which is like when we said when we mentioned that it's when Avon asked them if they had a declaration of neutrality. Uh, Zen refers to prior information by a specific date code. What was the date code that he used? And the answer was C303. Yeah. So you got both those right. Give yourself a pat on the back. <laughs> You uh, got him right. You either just watched this episode or you have a great memory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you remember from when you watched in the 80s? <laughs> that would be the most impressive thing. All right. So we actually got, th- well, we got two emails this week and we have two uh, comments on the website that we want to respond to. Typically, I don't think we want to do four responses, but one of the comments is like one line. So I figure it's, it's worth responding because it, it responds to something I actually asked people to do specifically. Now, the first email is from Sergeant Trainer. We actually got before we recorded the episode, so we recorded a response to that already. All of our other responses we're recording a week later after watching Dawn of the Gods, so we may reference Dawn of the Gods in our other responses, so I just want to also put that out there to let you know that we recorded these responses at different times. Hey, guys. So, Volcano, an episode with perhaps not the greatest reputation right off. We have Tarrant looking like he raided Blake's closet, poofy sleeves and all, and pointing <laughs> his gun at Dana's head while he talks on his bracelet. See attached image which we'll put in the show notes. Put it up in the show notes. Yep. Oh dear, a rather unfortunate robot with an even more unfortunate flashing belt buckle. Did you guys spot Tarrant wandering around with his gun not plugged into its battery pack, telephone cord just dangling behind him like a tail? I didn't See, catch attached, that. did not catch that, but once again, we'll put that image also. I, I noticed notes. him struggling with putting back his belt back on late in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Orac to Jean Chappelle, teleport operations, a menial task, much more suited to one such yourself, classic metal level burn. <laughs> Gotta love how Howard casually plays down how they've become pacifists by treating babies with electric shocks, psychological ma- manipulation and propaganda, and then later demonstrates his own pacifism by having the robot <laughs> shoot his own son to death. We forgot to mention the robot because I made a note oh, that it looked yeah. like Chameleon oh from God. Doctor yeah, Who. We didn't even mention this <laughs> robot. It didn't, uh, no, it didn't really look like Chameleon from Doctor Who. It reminded me of Chameleon. Because of how it like wasn't there yeah. ever. <laughs> and it just kind of walked in, shot someone, and left. <laughs> and then he tops that up by blowing up the entire planet. Yeah, we mentioned that, how like, are they really pacifists? They blow up the entire planet. No, they're not. They're really not. Pretty great scrap the Liberator gets into, simultaneously fighting an enemy fleet and a boarding party. Yeah. I thought the fight was shot pretty well. I didn't mention that. This is a new director for the show. I thought it was shot pretty well. It was pretty intense, actually. Pretty exciting. Wasn't really invested in it, though, because of the rest of the story. But anyway... These Federation troops are dressed a little differently than the usual ones. Their helmets especially are different. Any thoughts as to why? I didn't actually notice that. I didn't notice that either. That's probably something we should have noticed. But again, this story wasn't the most engaging. But this is possibly just due to the state the Federation is in. Yeah, wasn't it possibly because the Federation is in such a, a, a collapsed state? Or maybe these are either elite troopers or just a lower level of troops. Sub troopers. We also forgot to mention that Villa reveals that his like D grade level idiot, he bought right. that grade. Yeah, he, he's just been telling people about that because he didn't want to like get placed uh, yeah, into. Yeah, apparently he didn't want to be a space captain. So he bought a lower grade so that he wouldn't be placed as a space captain. Right, and Avon's again, like, I have difficulty believing that. And Villa's like, what, that I bought the grade? And then Avon's like, no, that you would have been a space captain. Yeah, well, again, this ties into what this series is doing with like belief and like people saying stuff and how that all works. Villa is, in my opinion, the least trustworthy person in the Liberator crew, even though he's always the voice of reason. I feel like 
We also know his backstory can constantly changes, and the only person we hear his backstory from is him. I feel like he's the most mysterious person. Yeah, really. we definitely just thinking about it. We know the least about him. Yeah, and, and like even this revelation, that's... which should be like a big thing, like, oh man, he bought this rank. Like, I think that calls into question a lot of things because now I don't think you can believe that he was that rank or that he bought it because. Yeah, who knows what you can believe. Because now it's really like, well, what is the truth? He's probably just a pathological liar. Because he's the one telling us yeah, this. The truth if is we, absolute, right? Well, I mean, because <laughs> he lived in the Federation. If we saw some Federation records about something, that would at least provide credence to one of the stories. But since he's the one telling us. Maybe, possibly. He's our only source of information. And if he's not, then the Federation is. So, like, who do you really want to believe and who can you believe in this situation? And again, how does, like, the truth... How does one? How does belief change? How does the truth change? And how do facts change? Because there is a difference between truth and fact. Mm-hmm. But how do all those things change depending on like the position, the rhetorical position, and how those are used and who's saying things? I don't know. I'm not. I don't have any answers to any of these questions. Just something I want to raise. Mm-hmm. Wow, Callie's te- telepathy is really not working very well this episode. She tries to warn Avon about the boarding party, but he doesn't hear her on the planet. Dana does hear, but it misunderstands what Callie's trying to tell her. Right, I think we mentioned that. I don't remember Dana missing. I yeah, I don't remember that part actually. Tense bit at the end there when Trooper Moy grapples with Tarrant near the crevasse over Orac, bites off one of his own fingers, and then plummets into the abyss, screaming, "My precious!" That's supposed Wait. to be a reference to Lord of the Rings. I guess so. <laughs> was that more? That wasn't Mori who fell, was it? I don't remember, oh but it might, it might have been. Yeah, because Mori is the one who kidnapped Orac, so it might have been actually. Yeah. Oh my god. Maybe this is one we're going to have to go back and rewatch. I don't think we paid enough attention to it. So at the end, the crew argue about who won and who lost. Callie says everyone lost except for the Pyroans, even though they're all dead now. So what do you guys think? Who won this one? Who lost? I think they did win, honestly. (laughs) They got basically everything that they wanted out of this. Because they didn't want to become a base for either the Federation or for, I guess, Avon's crew now. It's not called Blake's crew, but it's Avon's crew now. The Liberator crew. And at the end, I mean, Serverland, you know, the reason why they blow it up is because Serverland says, let's see how, like, really honest they are about actually using this failsafe. Land the party there. Let's just go in. And then they actually do it. So, Yeah, I, th- I think they came out, well, quote unquote, came out of this with what they wanted. I think they did win because they're the only ones who really said what they were going to do and then went along with it and then actually came out of it with any sort of victory. Yeah, it's a perfect victory because you're all dead. <laughs> but... Did the Liberator crew come out of this with anything? No, except the fact that Orac almost got kidnapped and the Liberator almost destroyed. Did Serverland come out of this with anything? No, Mori's dead. Even if Mori didn't die when he fell into the volcano, the planet blows up and he didn't get <laughs> teleported. He didn't get teleported up to a ship because the Federation doesn't have teleported technology, so he's dead anyway. Yeah, I guess Mori is for sure dead. Tarn, so, they could have done more with Mori. You know, could have done Mori with him. Oh, jeez. So Serverland loses a lot too, so... I think they did win. Sure. Also, why are they called the Pyroans if their planet is called Obsidian? Good question, Drano. I don't know the answer to that one. It's kind of like how humans are the called humans and not know. Earthens. Terrans. It's called Terrans a lot in a lot of stories. But even still, they... But That's even what Earth though, is called but, Terra, but... Yeah, but I was going to say in most of those stories, they still refer to it as Earth, unless they refer to it as Terra. Yep. Terra Prime. So, so episode for me took a long time to get through it. Yeah. Three out of seven. Looking forward to you guys talking about it, though. I was amazed how much you like the keeper. Maybe you'll like this one, too. No, yeah. surprise, we didn't. Sergeant Drano, Station 7, the door. So thanks. Thank you once again for emailing us and staying in touch with us and posing some interesting, I think, questions about the episodes, noticing yep. things that we didn't notice. Especially in this one. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious to know, actually, Drano, if you want to email us how long it took you to get through it, did you watch it all in one sitting or did you like split it up because you were just so bored by the episode? Because I, you know, we watch these, or at least I watch, I don't want to speak for Keon, I watch these in one sitting. I don't split it up in any sort of way. And I know this one was really difficult for me to get through. I wanted to take a break and stop and come back to it later, but. I did. I probably did like a couple times, just went and watched other videos or something online. I was like, oh, I can't do this anymore. So went back to it or whatever. But again, I think this is one we're going to have to come back and. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll have to do a a volcano redux episode. Who knows? Maybe. Right. As usual, this email section is a future incarnation of ourselves. <laughs> One week later. <laughs> One from, week later. From what was to you a minute ago. All right. So this second email is from good correspondent RG. I don't regular know why I said it like that. The regular correspondent is what I was actually going for. 
Hi again, Zeniths 2. Good at corresponding, I guess. Good at corresponding. <laughs> All right, so we have... Oh, yeah, we're Zeniths 2. <laughs> the, 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 like, headings again. We have original credits. Just wanted to point out to you that the thing moving back and towards on the original credits for Blake 7 was a security camera, not a gun. They yep. were only seen briefly in the first two episodes. One yep. of them was on the prison ship. This That's is a really something... embarrassing yeah, it is. <laughs> thing to have pointed out to Especially us. Especially because the first shot of the first episode, barring the intro sequence, is a camera. Especially since we went 26 episodes calling it a gun. 26 plus for me, I've probably... Right, 26 I, plus. I watched... Eight episodes twice, plus the tw- regular run of 26, so 32 for me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's correct. we've corrected ourselves now. Thank you, RG. All right, science fiction. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> I've been following your discussion about sci-fi with great interest, partly because I have both an MA and a BA with a literature focus. That means nice. I'm uniquely qualified to say, dost thou want fries with that? Many novels which were once considered sci-fi have now been reclassified as dystopian future. I'm thinking in particular of things like Brave New World, 1984, Fahrenheit 451, and The Handmaid's Tale. Rather than considering anything with both science and fiction in it to be sci-fi, I think it is better to see it as anything which has a fictional science in it. The words are round the wrong way. So H.G. Wells' Time Machine is sci-fi due to the fact that time machines don't currently exist. They are fictional. Whereas in 1984, there isn't any science that doesn't exist now or existed at the time. Even things like two-way monitors could be constructed in a crude fashion in 1949. 1984 is set in the future, though, and that future is bleak, thus it sits in the dystopian future genre. The role of sci-fi in the past has often been to comment on the nature of humanity, hence why classifying it has been has become a little convoluted. Side note, the concept of Soma as a calming drug was used in Brave New World long before Blake 7. Yeah, this is interesting. I really like that definition of, of flipping the words around. Well, actually, let me rephrase that. I like that lens. I'm not going to call it a definition because I don't want to define these things. Mm-hmm. And you use the word classified. That's also not something that I want to do. You bring up Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. Ray Bad- Bradbury was an auth- an interesting author because unlike people like Ursula K- Kayla Gwynn, who's who was like, you know, winning awards and like mm-hmm. national book awards and things. And she would go on stage and be like, hey guys, thanks for giving me this award for my science fiction book. And people were like, well, what the hell? You know, it's not science fiction. Like this is a great work of literature. And he's like, yeah, it's also science fiction. But Ray Bradbury was never really like that. He was an author who, he wrote what he wrote. And he won plenty of awards and recognition, uh, both in the science fiction community and outside of it. And he was, if, I, if I'm correct on this, he was always just like, yeah, I, I write what I write. And whatever it is, is whatever it is. And he wrote no, plenty that's of... That's not entirely correct. He did come out and say that Fahren- that everybody was interpreting Fahrenheit 451 wrong. Well, who knows if he even has the right to say that, but <laughs> or the authority to say that, let's say. But yeah, he's an interesting author. He's a very interesting and a very good author as well. Yeah, um, I agree. I don't have much to say on it. The only Ray Bradbury work I've read is actually something wicked this week on, so... Which is bizarre. There's a, there's a there's a cool one called Mars is Heaven or some Mars is Paradise, something like that. It's a short story. It's a really good one. Um... Yeah, this is another interesting point on this science fictional discussion, this sort of mm-hmm. um, lens. I'll mention it next. Uh, actually, never mind. I'm not going to mention that. <laughs> um, but you also bring up um, Soma, mm-hmm. uh, how it was used in Brave New World. Soma, I think we actually touched on this in Horizon. Uh, Soma is it's a it's a mythical like drink. It's from yeah. multiple world mythologies. Um, as like a cure-all drink, or like a panaceic drink, mm-hmm. which is cool. They mix it with adrenaline here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's in a name? I don't know if you've already worked this out, but the male crew members on Blake 7 are referred to the, by their surnames, except for Villa. I'm not sure if this was to show him as weaker than the other blokes. We never learned Callie's surname, but his species may not have them. Servaline was originally going to be very masculine. They were going to have her wear a military outfit, but Jax persuaded them that it would be far more original to write a character who sounded like a man, but who dressed in a hyper-feminine way. Having been a teenager when Blake 7 was airing, I can tell you that androgyny was very popular, with women like Annie Lennox and Grace Jones being seen as the height of fashion. Thus, Servaline's mix of buzz cut and high fashion suited those times perfectly. All this might be why she is only ever referred to by one name in the series. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's really interesting. I noticed that Villa was the only one who was called by his first name, the only one of the the guys that is. And I didn't like bring it up or anything because I didn't think too much of it. But yeah, it's a good point. You know, maybe mm-hmm. maybe he is just sort of seen as weaker. I, I don't, truly don't know. Possibly, but that's that's an interesting point. Maybe it's just because 
calling Avon Kerr would sound absolutely <laughs> stupid every week, and calling Tarrant <laughs> Dell every week would be also absolutely stupid. Well, I don't think Dell – Kerr is like kind of – don't forget o- Olag. Well, yeah, Olag and Kerr are, are questionable. Raj is also uh, sort of questionable. I don't think Dell is is a. Uh, un- I don't think it would I feel sound like Dell's more questionable out of than place. Raj. Yeah, I, mm, I don't know. I don't think I don't feel like disregarding Raj for a minute. I don't feel like it would be abnormal to say like, "Hey, Dell," or like Dell went and did uh, something like that. I, I guess. Know. Avon and Cali. If you watch Avon and Cali closest this season, you will see some fondness developing. Some fans take the opinion that they were stupidly kept apart in the first two seasons, but we're finally allowed to interact in this one. I don't have much to say on that because we haven't watched much of the season. Well, and also Avon is coming into that leader role, maybe going to be yeah. interacting with people he didn't necessarily interact with as much, like Cali. Um, we also have that point about Servaland. That's really interesting. I didn't really like know any of that. Huh. The Avon game, the season we get to play a game. Who does Avon kiss this week? You mentioned that Blake should have been the one to kill Travis too, not Avon, but Blake didn't really care about Travis. He just saw him as an annoying little bug to avoid. It was Travis who had the obsession with Blake. I find it quite delicious that at their final showdown, Travis doesn't even get off by his nemes- nemesis. Pathetic. Uh, I guess. The, who does Avon kiss this week? At least in the four that we've watched, Aftermath, Power Play, Volcano. He's just Serverland so far, right? And um, Dawn of the Gods was just Serverland. So well, he has, what, eight more episodes? Nine more? Yeah, nine to go. Got to get those numbers yeah. up, Avon. Those are rookie numbers. <laughs> the Avon game. This. Uh, so I read that one already. Sorry. Servaland gets some action. I quite like how Servaland plotted behind the scenes in the first two series. From now on, she does a lot of work herself. I don't like that as much, but it does put her in some interesting situations with the Liberator crew. She starts to wear less and less white, opting more for colors which don't show the dirt. The actor used to make grand entrance every day on set, modeling her outfit for that episode. That's actually uh, an interesting thing. Jacqueline Pierce, I believe is her name, is the actress's yep. name. Yep. Uh, we haven't seen Silverland much. She was in Volcano, Power Play, and Aftermath, but not in Dawn of the Gods. Uh, that's something I want to reserve judgment on until the end of the season, actually. Sure. And then Volcano, you wanted to know how I reacted to this episode when I first saw it. That was in 1980, so I'll try my best to remember. I'm very biased about anything Stephen Pacey does because I am female, and he is just so damn pretty. I could watch him do the dusting and be perfectly happy. I enjoyed him and Dana going to the Volcano Planet together. I thought it gave good insight into their characters. We got to see how Dana always has a keepsake from her father with her and how she has allies in the galaxy. With Tarrant, we got to hear more about him being a Federation pilot, and so his no-nonsense approach to the situation at hand. I really love when he listens to Dana after she hears Callie. He's not so arrogant that he thinks he knows best. I really like Dana and Tarrant together on the planet as it's about to blow up. They make plans together. We get to see Dana put her pyrotechnic skills to good use, and they don't just abandon Callie. They were a good team. All the principal players did a great job this episode. The support acting is what let it down. The father and son were both dreadful. When the father got the robot to kill his son, I didn't really care, and I don't think he did either. Callie's telepathy was used extremely well. That's all for me. As Avon said, down safe. RG forgot to mention that Tarrant says down safely, the oh, more yeah. inferior version of down <laughs> safe in this episode. Yeah, all, all this is really good. Like I mentioned earlier, we did really give Volcano the short end of the stick. At this mm-hmm. point, you, Dylan, have gone back yeah, I and went rewatched back and rewatched Volcano it. And noticed a lot more, and we'll mm-hmm. discuss that a lot more next week in Dawn of right. the Gods. But we did really sort of not give it all it was due. We didn't give it what it was due, and we also really didn't give Dana the credit she was due in this episode. Dana really did do a lot more than I think we pointed out that she did. I'm really interested to see that you liked Dana and Tarrant together on the planet. We got a comment on the website, which I'm going to bring in right now, from a guy named John, uh, who says, Yes, I started watching Series C, and I liked Dana and Tarrant together. Episodes such as Trader and the Parts and Head Under and Harvest of Kairos. which That's promising. Promising, and also kind of plays into this theory that I had at the start of this Volcano episode that potentially... If you started with Series C, you may be more okay with the Dana Tarrant pairing because everybody is a new character to you and not just Dana and Tarrant. Yeah. Whereas I believe that if you know the other characters, you're going to have more of a problem with this because it doesn't give you anything to work with and you kind of are wishing that you got more Avon or Callie or Villa, right? But that's actually really interesting and thank you for for emailing us that. Uh, And I'm really glad to hear from you, RG. Always have good insights. Much like Sergeant Trainer, we have such good correspondence on the show, honestly. Just take over our places. <laughs> just take over. We'll just We're hand the show the over to RG and Sergeant Drano. They can be the two new hosts and we'll just like produce from the background or something. But we definitely didn't give Volcano its June and you know, I say a lot more on it next week because I rewatched it. I did I was a good podcast host and went back and rewatched it like I should. I didn't. And then we have one final comment here. This is from St. Clinton, who is back again to correspond with us. Yep. 
Yes, I have still been listening to each and every episode and still think that this is the greatest Blake 7 podcast ever. You all are catching things that I hadn't noticed in the long time that I've been watching and rewatching the episodes. Yes, I'm one of those who's been enjoying the sci-fi conversations. That's good to hear. Awesome. I'm so glad that you all have finally reached my favorite character, that being Dana. When I saw the episode for the first time with her first scenes, I was hoping that she would become a new member of the crew, not like other previous guest people that haven't. Now, I will admit that she isn't the greatest actress in the world, but she is the only character that I developed a crush on with the show over the long run. From what I have read, this was one of Gisette Simon's first TV roles. If you saw the 2017 Wonder Woman film, Gisette was in it. I did have one on Jacqueline Pierce, Serverland, but that changed when I saw interviews of her outside the character. <laughs> I'm not saying she's ugly, but her outfits on the show are a true testament to how great the wardrobe department was for the show when it came to her. If you want to see, and more importantly, hear something really interesting, look on YouTube and find an interview with Stephen Pacey, who plays Del Tarrant. In this season, the show takes a twist that I think turned out to be a little more interesting to me, being that it became more like a sci-fi western to me, and even more so in the final season. Anyways, still loving the show and looking forward to more episodes from you all. St. Clinton. First off, thank you for mentioning that Gisette Simon was in Wonder Woman because that made me go check her IMDb page. And I've had this thing in the back of my head, like she looked familiar to me, but I couldn't quite like place it. And on her IMDb page, I found out she was actually in Broadchurch season three, which I have watched. And so it finally clicked. I was like, oh, I've seen Gisette Simon before. So it finally clicked for me. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, in yeah. regards to the wardrobe department, we actually talk about that more interesting next week on Dawn of the Gods. Uh, Keon brings up some stuff about oh, how good yeah, the costume is. You forget it? We recorded that just, an, just yes. an hour ago. Yep. You also bring up um, Gisette Simon's acting as not as strong, maybe, or... Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, I have i haven't had a problem with it so far. I don't think she... I haven't yeah. seen her uh, as, like, a weaker actor than anyone else on the show, really. So yeah, far, at it, least. I think I've, it's serviceable. I yeah. honestly don't think it's bad at all. No, I don't. If this is her first TV role, it's actually rather good. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, if it is her first TV role, she can only go off from there. She was really fantastic in Broadchurch now that I actually made the connection that that's her. And thank you for giving us such kind words of encouragement. Yeah, best Blake 7 podcast. There, there are definitely other great ones out there. Yeah, my I think my favorite is Blake 7 in character, uh, which examines a character of Blake 7 in each of their episodes, which is an awesome podcast if you want to check that out. I haven't listened to a lot of other Blake 7 podcasts, but... Definitely Blake Seven character is a good one to check out. And we always like list off all the other podcasts because why not? It was down and safe. Which hasn't updated, I think, in, in two years now or a year. A year like a year and six months, I think. And then there's Spacefall. Started around the same time that we did, but they're doing uh one episode bi -weekly, every I think. two weeks. A little slower, a little more in depth than we are. Yep. Is making Blake Seven and from a, like a place of more Twitter knowledge feedback. because they've watched the show and it yeah. came out and have rewatched it since and know a lot more. Yeah, and then there's Blake Seven in character, and then there's there's one more that's uh, completed. Uh, classically awful is not. Oh, it's classically awful that, that just one started. Is not completed, but is similar to what we do almost. Mm -hmm. and, and there is one that's completed that finished in like 2013. It's rather old, and I'm forgetting the name, but I'll put it in the show notes. And other than that, you know, if you would like to email us, you can reach us at thedoctordeckandvegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, love letters, your thoughts on the rather mediocre or underwhelming volcano. And it's Shaken Blake, that other podcast, by the way. There it is. That's what it is. Thank you for looking that up. You can find us on YouTube at Decorative Vegetable. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and Google Play at Zenith, a Blake 7 podcast. Be sure to leave a rating if you like the show. Check us out on Facebook. Trust your doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us out on Twitter at TYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. And next time we're watching Dawn of the Gods. But until then, the end. <laughs>